أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأفضل الصلاة والتسليم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا واللعنة الدائمة الأبدية على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق الله سبحانه وتعالى states in the Holy Quran and what he says is the truth in the chapter of Al-Isra, chapter 17, verse 88, Allah says, قُلْ لَإِنْ اجْتَمَعَتِ الْإِنْسُ وَالْجِنُّ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لَا يَأْتُونَ بِمِثْلِهِ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ ظَهِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, say, if the nations of mankind and jinn were to try to come up with a Quran such as this one, Surely they would not be able to even if they were to support each other. Sadaq Allahul Ali al Azim, Amanna Billah. Brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Welcome to another episode. As we go through these foundational um, uh, classes and learning um, the true theology that we must know in order for us to have strong Tawheed, belief in Allah. Now, in the last episode, we left off speaking about the Unitarian, Binitarian, and Trinitarian belief system. We mentioned that the Unitarians believe in one God, and we mentioned the chapter of Al-Buruj, which is chapter 85. Um, the verses we mentioned were verses 4 to 7. We also um, uh, uh, mentioned the ideology of the uh, Binitarians and the Trinitarians. Now, we said that the Binitarians believe that uh, they believe in the Father and the Son, that uh, the two are one, we said that the two, no matter how much you squeeze them together, can't be one. But if they say that, you know, it's one uh, f uh, finger like this with two parts, then that's problematic because really what we're saying is we're saying that Allah is limited to parts. That's one. And we proved that Allah is unlimited in the first episode. So that uh, is totally contradictory to Allah's perfection. However, let's say, let's say um, that... Uh, God is one in this way and that he is compound. Well, their claim is that Jesus was crucified on the cross. So if he was crucified, then the son is missing of that one, which means God would then be deficient. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all perfect. He can't be deficient, right? So that's another way of disproving the issue of um, a Christian dogma that believes that um, um, the Father and the Son make up one. And the same thing can be applied to those of the Trinity, those Trinitarians who believe that the three are one. So no matter how much I squeeze these three digits together, they can't be one. But let's say I say that the one is made out of parts. Again, I say if it's parts, then that means Allah is limited. And we proved that Allah is unlimited in the first episode. So that refutes that idea. But let's say, let's play devil's advocate and let's say that that is the case. Again, they say that Jesus was crucified and if Jesus was crucified, then that would mean that the whole would be missing a part. And that means that God would then be deficient. So this is problematic again also. Now, we mentioned the chapter of Al-Ikhlas, chapter 112. In the very, very first verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ Say that Allah is unique. This Ahad, which means uniqueness, Ahadiyya, the concept of Ahadiyya, is that there is no other like him. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ now in order for there to be no other like him, he would have to be unlimited because everything in this limited universe can be compared to its counterparts, right? In some way or another, at the very least in shared time or space, for example. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-Ahad, the most unique, is unlimited. Therefore, the Quran clearly um, uh, explains uh, and refutes um, past claims by scholars um, of past religions. So here then we understand we've covered several points, four points in particular. First, that the Qur'an is consistent just as Allah is consistent. Two, that the Qur'an is non-contradictory, doesn't have any flaws in it, just as Allah has no flaws in him. It's the same Qur'an from 1400 years ago until today, and it has no flaws. We also looked at the science of the Holy Qur'an. We proved that there are scientific facts in the Holy Qur'an that um, uh, from 1400 years ago no one would have known except for the creator of the universe himself. And then we looked at um, the claims of past religions and um, uh, we were able to refute those uh, claims that were wrong. Today what we want to do 
is um, uh, we want to look at the idea, which is the fifth point, the idea that the Qur'an has to be miraculous, has to be supernatural, has to come in the language of the people. So it came to the Arabian pen Peninsula. Specifically, the Arabia, Arabian Peninsula was a very tough, arid area of land. It is a, a land that um, was not um, uh, broken by, uh, um, by uh, Persia or the Roman Empire or the Green, Greek Empire or the Babylonians or the Assyrians or anybody of that time. None of them were able to break through the Arabian Peninsula. Why? Because it was an arid desert. Um, it was unforgiving and uh, nobody would be able to uh, infiltrate it. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the message within that specific area that has not been infiltrated by any of these great superpowers that existed at the time. Therefore, the sheer fact that um, the Qur'an was able to come into that area and change the entire area is in itself a miracle. But the main miracle of the Holy Qur'an itself is the fact that it came in, an, in the um, language of the Arabs. It came um, challenging the Arabs with their own language proving to them that uh, no one could come up with words that are as eloquent as uh, the words of God. So we find, for example, that in Christianity or um, in uh, Judaism, we find that whether it's Jesus or Moses, each one of them, they came um, with a miracle that defied the, the uh, science or the high priests of the time, right? They, for example, Moses, he came to the magician, magicians, of, of magicians of his time, and what did he do? He threw the staff, it turned into a serpent, and it ate all of their uh, um, uh, staffs. And then the high priest would be the first to bow down and to concede and uh, believe in the oneness of God, right? Now in the time of Jesus, he came during the time of medicine, so he would heal the blind, he would give them sight, he would heal the leper, give them health, he would bring the dead back to life, all with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the miracle of the Prophet ﷺ was the Holy Qur'an. Now, we started out with a verse, right? The verse states and say that if, the, if mankind and the jinn were to try to come up with a Qur'an such as this, that surely they would not be able to, even if they were to support each other. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was challenging them with the message itself. So, and I want you to humor me for a bit. Now, we know that in today's times, if you were to go to a poetry slam, right, um, what would happen? You would go to the slam and you would literally have beautiful words that you've written in verses and you would challenge others, other poets, to prove who's better, right, who's more eloquent. Now, during that time, that was a time of poetry, of eloquence of speech in Arabia. Now, the Arabs themselves, every year during the time that we know as Hajj, would get together, they would congregate, and they would have a poetry slam. They'd have a competition. The winner, his verses would actually be hung on the side of the Kaaba. It was known as Al-Mu'allaqat. So what we know today as the curtain, the black curtain that's around the Kaaba, today it has Quranic verses written on it. But during that time, what would be placed there are the winning verses of that poet. So just as today, for example, we know rappers, for example, when they go, or po poets who go to a poetry slam, what they do is they usually say, for example, A to the B to the C, right? They say, oh, look at these letters. These are the letters that I'm going to use to lay down heavy words upon you, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually states in the Holy Quran, He says, and we shall bring down unto you heavy words. Inna anzalna alayka qawlan. Thaqila, Allah says. And then we find in many chapters of the Holy Quran, such as Al-Baqarah, for example, when we started out with the verse that we did last episode and the episode before, Alif Lam Mim, or in another chapter, Kaf Ha Ya Ain Saad, or in another chapter, Ta Ha, or in another chapter, Ya Sin, for example, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells His Prophet to tell them, look at these letters, now watch what I'm going to do with them. And then He challenges them with these words. He says to them, bring me a Qur'an like this Qur'an. So even if they supported each other, they wouldn't be able to come up with a Qur'an such as this according to that verse. And surely 
the Arabs weren't able to come up with a full book, a full Quran like it. The next challenge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala posed is he said, okay, well you can't come up with a whole Quran, why don't you come up with 10 chapters like it? So we find, for example, that in the chapter of Hud, chapter 11, verse 13, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, he says, أَمْ يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَاهُ uh, Or do they say that he made these words up? So Allah says, after he says, أَمْ يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَاهُ قُلْ فَأْتُوا بِعَشْرِ سُوَرٍ مِثْلِهِ مُفْتَرَيَاتٍ وَادْعُوا مَنْ اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ So he says, and if they say, they have doubt in you, and they say that you, um, um, you made this up, he says to them, challenge them, tell them, come up with 10 chapters that are made up, like it. And then call your people, call your posse, so to speak. Call these people that you want to testify, right, to say that your words were stronger and better. So um, he poses that challenge to them and they fail again, right? So now that was the second challenge. The third challenge is mentioned in the chapter of Yunus which is chapter 10, verse 38, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, He says, again, أَمْ يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَاهُ Or do they say that He made it up? قُلْ فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِثْلِهِ Right? Allah says, or do they say that He made it up? Then come up with one chapter like it. وَدْعُوا مَنْ اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ دُولِ اللَّهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And um, call your, your, your people and let them testify, right? To, uh, to say what is better, who's, who's the winner? And again, they fail. Now, the final challenge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala poses is a very important challenge. And this challenge in, is mentioned in the chapter of Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 23. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, He says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ وَادْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, He says, and um, if you have doubt in the message that has been sent to you, then um, bring us a chapter from someone like him. And then call your people. Let them testify if you are saying the truth. Again, they fail. Now, this final challenge is what we want to end our episode with and it is what we'll start our next episode with insha'Allah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala poses the challenge now since they failed to bring um, a book, 10 chapters or even one chapter like that that is mentioned in the Holy Quran the final challenge is to bring a chapter from someone like him specifically this Prophet in the next episode, insha'Allah, what we'll be talking about is the messenger, proving the messenger. What characteristics should he have? Who is he? Why is it that the Qur'an poses the challenge this way? That although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that they failed completely in coming up with a message like it, here Allah poses another challenge. So he, he defeats them miraculously. So the miracle of the Holy Qur'an becomes the eloquence of the Holy Qur'an, right? But how is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now challenges them next? That's through the messenger himself. So what characteristics should he have? Um, uh, and what effect does that have on the delivery of the message? We're going to talk about it intellectually speaking, with intellectual reasoning, how to come up with and how to prove that you need a messenger, what characteristics does he have, and also what comes next after that and what would his role be. I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to realize this great knowledge that we are learning bi ta'ala. Surely we proved that the Qur'an is the message of Allah and therefore from now on when we take um, uh, surahs or we take uh, verses from the Holy Qur'an, ayat, now they have a greater meaning to us. Why? Because we value that they are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe in the fact that they are divine words from the unlimited creator and therefore we are committed to understanding their meanings and to learning them. Um, I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to realize our purpose in life through inshallah the message of Allah that he allows us to continue our learning, to brighten our hearts with the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Mursaleen. Habibi ilaha al-alameen. 
أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين